It's Brunching with Tony Marinero, Sunday, January 2nd, presented by Cherry River Hard Seltzer, only 90 calories, natural flavors, no preservatives now available in Quebec grocery stores and at the beer store. And we're talking Habs with Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette and HockeyInsideOut.com. Stu, Happy New Year, bud. Same to you, Tony. All the best. Wishing you more health than the Montreal Canadiens had in 2021. Oh, boy. What a rough end. That was something. Although, I'll give them credit because that game against Florida, you know, there were 11 forwards and uh, five defense, and they battled hard. I mean, they, they played as hard as they could, and the best result you could probably expect from that scenario. Sam Montembeau played well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's thankfully they're shut down now for, for about a week. Uh, hopefully everybody can be healthy by the time they come back. Uh, but by the way this variant spreads, you know, the flight back home, you wonder how many guys caught it on the flight back home. So it'll be interesting to see this week how many more cases we have. That was insane yesterday before they took on the Florida Panthers yesterday afternoon. It was a one o'clock start. We knew that the Canadians were depleted with injuries and decimated and had a bunch of players on the COVID-19 protocol. And before the game, we get word that Jake Evans and Alexander Romanov had been added to the protocol as well. At that point, the Canadians had to dress 11 forwards and five defensemen. Stu, look, let's be honest. Uh, notwithstanding that uh, pretty much all of us who are on the whole rebuild train are okay with the games to happen because it doesn't give them a very good chance of winning. Therefore, they lose. It gives them a better chance at a better pick. But let's forget about that for just a minute here. Once again like last game and maybe even the game before that game should have never have happened yesterday afternoon. Uh, yeah. Although listening to Pierre Lebrun yesterday on the telecast and he's as plugged in as anybody, he suggested that the Canadians were given the option not to play and decided they wanted to play. So maybe they're a hundred percent in on this tank also, Tony and the you know, losses. I believe them. Stu. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that a hundred percent. You have to think, you know, I mean, as I said, Lebrun's so well plugged in and you have to think the NHL should have at least, said to the Canadians, you guys still want to play this game? And if the Canadians said we do, well, then I guess they're going to go ahead. I mean, the fact, I also wonder how much it plays into, uh, LeBron did a story where he talked with Daly the other day, um, and Daly was saying there's a lot of different reasons that come into whether they decide to cancel a game or postpone a game or not. And I wonder how much of it factors in that the Canadians are out of the playoff race already. Uh, these games are almost meaningless for them. And people say, yeah, but for the other team, it's like three points. Well, it's not like the Canadians were that competitive before they had COVID. It's not like this was a really good team and all of a sudden they got sick and they're losing games. They were losing games before when people were healthy. So I, I figure that has to factor into it. And if LeBron is correct, and I have no reason to doubt him, that the Canes were given the opportunity to say they didn't want to play and they wanted to play, well, the NHL's going to let them play. Stu, I've said this before and I maintain it. There are things that an organization can do so that they tank. You... Um, don't put your best lineup out there. You don't put your best lines out there. You don't put your players on when they should be on. And yes, the coach has to be in on it. By the way, there has to be a talk with him saying, hey, by the way, pressure's off. You're not going to get fired. And, um, you know, try and stay in games. But, um, you know, if you lose, it's not the end of the world. And um, take a look at, there's also things that players do. And I know that players are wired to win games and I get all that. But when you're losing games and your season is pretty much over, it's easier for a player to take himself out of the game. And it's easier for a player to take a little bit longer to get back in the lineup. And I think that those are things that are happening as well this year. Without a doubt. I mean, it's just that 11 forwards to start the game that Cedric Paquette gets hurt. If that's a regular player on the Canadians, I don't think he probably comes back in that game. But Cedric Paquette is playing for his future in the NHL right now whether it's with Montreal or wherever else it would be. So he comes back. And the other thing I found interesting about this, Tony, is just the compete level has been so much better the last little while when they've been, you know, so many guys on the COVID list. And it leads me to believe, and we've spoken about this before, that I think a lot of the veteran guys had given up on playing for Ducharme and playing Ducharme's system. And now you've got all these new guys in that are just so happy to be in the yeah. NHL and are playing for their future. This is an opportunity, you know, Hillis, I mean, there's a guy I never expected. He was playing with Troy Rivera to start the season. Here he is now playing yep. in the NHL. So these guys are going to give you everything they have. Mike Pizzetta, uh, these kind of guys, they never expected to be in the NHL. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, something they've dreamed about since they were little kids. And it shows just with the way they're competing. The talent level isn't there on the ice. 
but the compete level has really been impressive. These guys have been working hard. And I think, you know, we we're talking about the coach being told that his job's not on the line. Uh, this is, I think, a case of a bunch of players who are willing to play uh, and willing to compete every night. Whereas I think when all the veterans are in the lineup, I don't think they were. Sharing is caring. Share the video and uh, comment. Uh, and, um, you know, we're going to get to all your Habs questions. We are live uh, on Facebook. We're also live on YouTube. We're live on Twitter. And on Twitter, by the way, and if you follow us, follow at the Sick Podcast, you'll notice that there's a little bell, which is notify me. And if you click on that bell, anytime the Sick Podcast goes live, you'll be notified. So we are live. It's Brunchin with Marinero. We'll get to all your Montreal Canadiens questions. Stu, I want to comment very quickly before I get to Remy Belanger's question on what you said. I said this also when the season started, and that was the Canadians were an inferior team on paper to start the season than the one that played in the Stanley Cup final. And once they got word that Carey Price entered the player assistance program, I think this was a this, I, I think it was a demoralized group. Uh, I think they weren't ready to start the season. Some of them were still, you know, really shaken up after losing in the final. It was a short summer. And I don't think they gave their best, and I don't think they tried their hardest. And I do think that some of the veterans also looked at their long-term deals and said, you know what, this is probably just a wasted season. I'm not going to kill myself. And and so there's two things that are happening with the young players getting an opportunity. One, there is no tomorrow for them, much like the movie The Replacements. But number two, it also goes to highlight that the veteran players weren't working as hard as they should have. Remy Belanger says, if the Habs have the second pick after the lottery, would you gamble and make an offer to a real bad team like Arizona or Seattle for an unprotected first next year? Two chances for Bedard Michkov. Stu, you want to tackle that one? It's an interesting question. That's a really interesting question. And, man, I think you'd have to think about it. I really think you would have to think about it. Um, I guess it will depend on... Um, what Jeff Gordon and whoever his new director of scouting is, you got to figure eventually he's going to hire one pretty soon. What they think about uh, this year's draft, and from what I've been reading and hearing from people who follow these junior players a lot closer than me, is that this draft this year isn't necessarily that good. So um, I would definitely, I'd, I'd think about it for sure. Bedard and Michkov were scheduled to go 1-2 in 2023. With all due respect to Shane Wright and the other players who are 2022 draft eligible, their ceiling is a lot higher. Most experts will tell you that they will be much better hockey players than anybody else in 2022. Like, with all due respect to Shane Wright, good player, and I say it's going to be all right, and he would be my pick if I had the number one pick. I think the World Junior Championships, albeit it didn't last very long, showed us that Connor Bedard is another level. This guy's cut from a different cloth. Back to yeah, more questions. Already- Bedard as a 16-year-old was more impressive, but the World Juniors, the short period there was there than Wright was, without a doubt. Yeah. By the way, yesterday, uh, in his first game back with his junior team, scored four goals again. How many 16-year-olds do you know scored eight goals in their last two very competitive hockey games? That's what Connor Bedard just did. Ethan Bondi, out of the eight people being interviewed, who do you think will be the best fit? Now, Stu, let me see if I can rattle these eight people off the top of my head. I know you'll be here to help me out. Um, Matthew Darsh, Daniel Briere, Stefan Quintal, Patrick Roy, Mark Denis, Daniel Sauvageau, uh, Emily Castonguay, and um, Kent Hughes, Daniel Br- and Kent Hughes, and Kent Hughes. Those are the eight that we're hearing. We'll have virtual interviews starting on Wednesday. The Canadians, by the way, a 12-day layoff. They were supposed to play some games at home. Jeff Molson said, let's postpone those because he's had enough of playing games with no fans in the stands. So he wants to reschedule those games when they will be able to put some fans in the stands, if not all, later on in 2022. Um, I think I know where you're going to go with this. Yeah, Matthew Matthew Darsh has the best... Matthew Darsh has the best chance? I said Matthew Darsh right from the start. I think he has the best tra- chance. Uh, Patrick Wois' name was on that list. Um, I don't see him getting the job, but I think Jeff Gordon would get crucified even more than he has already if he doesn't at least interview Patrick Wois. 
even if he doesn't get the job. Of course, just, of course. They name a GM and Patrick was that they never ever even interviewed me. We know what's going to happen after that. So yeah, uh, it's not up to So he's going to interview Patrick. Well, to me, I think Matthew Darsh is the guy at the top of the list. Um, Kent Hughes is a really interesting guy still out there. I really wonder about him because him and Gordon have a relationship from their days in Boston when Gordon was the GM there. And Kent Hughes has been based in Boston for a long time. Patrick Bergeron is one of his big clients. Stu, that would be a huge pay cut, though, you would think, for Kent Hughes. I mean, I don't know the specifics of, you know, I don't know his financials, but based on his portfolio of players that he represents, you would think that it would be a huge pay cut. But if he'd be willing to take the job, I got to tell you something. I think he's Gordon's guy. I think Gordon's really interested in him, Tony. And you're right. Not only a pay cut, but his family is really settled there in Boston. They live in a really nice area, nice suburb. He's been there for a long time. Doesn't have the pressure, or the spotlight that he would have in Montreal. But he probably has as much money as you'll ever need already. And you I never have enough, Stu. You I never have enough. Use personally, but maybe this is something that would intrigue him. You know, the, the, a chance to be GM of the Montreal Canadiens doesn't come up a lot. And if we're you know, all GMs are hired to be fired, let's say he's here for three, four years and, and loses the job, it doesn't stop him from being able to go back. And being a player agent again, so I think, I think if Gordon has a list, I wouldn't be surprised if Kent Hughes is at the top of that list. I really wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if Matthew Darsh is uh, the GM that's chosen in the end. He, based on everything I hear, has a great relationship with Jeff Molson. He's a former Montreal Canadian, McGill grad. Um, I would think he wants to come back to Montreal at some point, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, his son is going to be going to McGill. Uh, and, um, you know, it just two last two years, two Stanley Cups, working alongside Julian Brisebois. With all due respect to the candidates, Julian Brisebois would probably be the best one, but we know it's not possible because he signed an extension with the Tampa Bay Lightning. So I wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be surprised if it's him. But I'm going to tell you right now, if Matthew Darsh is the next GM of the Montreal Canadiens, the next coach of the Canadians after Dominic Ducharme, I'll make the prediction. I made it already. I'm going to make it again. The next coach of the Canadians after Ducharme will be Guy Boucher. That, well, there's there's the McGill connection there. And I'll throw out another connection. He played for him with the Hamilton Bulldogs, and they are, by the way, very, very good friends. Yeah, and uh, that McGill connection is really strong. I mean, the, the, the bond of the McGill is... Yep. Know, is is really strong, and that's uh, quite a possibility. And here's another link I'll throw out there, Tony. If Kent Hughes is the new GM, I think Jimmy Montgomery is a candidate to be head coach because they're friends. They have a connection together. They played together at, in, at CJ Hockey in Quebec. Um, Jimmy Montgomery's bilingual. He speaks his French is excellent. He grew up in the East End of Montreal, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so there's a connection with those two guys also. But, um, you know, for me, I said, Matthew, to me, Matthew Darsh, would be my pick. Uh, I do know Matthew a little bit. I'm not going to say we're friends, but I've, I've spent time with him. He's a very impressive guy. He's smart, well-respected, very calm. Uh, unlike Mark Bergevin, I don't think he's a guy who's going to let emotions get in the way of any decisions that he makes, which I think was one of Bergevin's biggest problem. He couldn't differentiate the attitude he has as a player. He couldn't separate business from getting personal like he did with Markov and Pat Chiretti and PK and so many other guys. I think he Darsh, won't be making decisions alone either, right? He's going to have Jeff Gordon there by his side. His background. You know, when he, yeah. when he left hockey, he worked at Delamar as a vice president role there. Uh, he's, he has a hockey background. He has a business background. And just before COVID hit, the Canes were in Tampa, and I was traveling with the team. And I sat down with Matthew Darsh for about an hour. And he told me at the time that Julian Brisebois, that he does – like he's every meeting that Julian Brisebois is in, Matthew Darsh is with him. He's, he's, he's involved in everything – that Julian Brisebois does. He's been doing that for a couple of years. So he's getting, I mean, I can't think of a better education to be a GM in the NHL than being Julian, at this point, than being Julian Brisebois' right-hand man, the GM who's won the last two Stanley Cups. Yeah, I've been so told to me, we have... To me, I think the only ahead. thing with Matthew Darsh, that if, if, if I was Matthew Darsh, his concern might be how much pull am I going to have? Like how many, how many decisions am I going to make or am I just going to be glorified translator for Jeff Gordon. He's going to be making all the calls and I'm going to be going in front of the French media to explain it. So I, I don't think it'll be that way. I think Gordon is looking for somebody to work with. Yes. And I think if Darsh is comfortable with the working environment that they would have together, 
uh, again, Matthew Darsh would be my pick. I, I don't see it as a bad thing. I actually see it as a good thing. I've said this before, and once again, I'm also going to say it again. You get to work alongside. You get to be shadowed and mentored by Jeff Gordon. Being the GM of the Montreal Canadiens is not being the GM of any other team. It's that times five, maybe that even times times ten. Mark Bergevin, with all his baggage of experience, was learning on the job for the first four or five years. He got better in the last three years on the job than he was in the first six years on the job. So I don't look at it as a bad thing. I've been told we have a lot of questions, and I want to try and get to as many of them as possible. Let's try and hit minimum 50 questions today. We got one in. Let's go to number two. All right. Alex McLean, do you think any trades are coming soon? If so, who will be heading out? Stu? I don't think we're going to see any trades until Gordon names a GM. Because if we do, it just goes back to what we were talking about before. Is the next GM really going to be the GM? Or is he just going to be some guy translating for, for Gordon? So I don't, even if Gordon has trades in the work, the plans that he wants to make right now, I think he's going to hold off until there's a GM in place and run those past the GM and get his input on it. At least that's what he should do. Uh, I think the Canadians start making moves, I would say, uh, probably February. Um, I think by the end of January, yeah. Early February at the latest, we're going to know who the GM is. and who the, I imagine they're going to probably have maybe one press conference where they answer GM. I think an assistant GM. I think the two women we mentioned earlier, I think one yeah. of them is going to be the assistant GM along with the scouting director. And uh, Jeff Petrie will not be a Montreal Canadian next season. So I don't know if he's going to be traded this season, at the draft, in the offseason. But I'm telling you right now, Jeff Petrie will not be a Montreal Canadian next season. More questions. This one here coming in from Cal B. When the Habs have all their injured wingers back, can they be respectable? Um, I say no, because by that point, their season will be over anyway. They're not making the playoffs. So guys are not going to give their 100%. And by the way, you don't build a team with wingers. Wingers are support players. You build a team down the middle. Center is the most important position. And of course, you need a goalie. Stu, anything you want to add? I agree with you. I mean, when all the all the wingers were healthy at the start of the season, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, and they, they weren't, you know, all the talk for the season, how many 20 goal scores they were going to have, how many 30 goal scores. If you don't have centermen to get them the puck, as you said, wingers. I mean, and and that's that's why I, I, it upsets me when I hear people who criticize Philip Dano's game because he doesn't produce offense. And I think I've mentioned this before on your show, Tony. Offense starts from the defensive zone. You got to get the puck out of your zone and get the puck to the wingers on the fly to create offense. And that's what Philip Dunn was able to do. And the Canes don't have enough centers right now that are able to do that. So these wingers don't get the puck in scoring positions and don't get a chance to score. Dano was the glue that kept it all together. And I know that a lot of people thought that Gallagher was. He's not. Gallagher is the spark plug. Dano was the glue. You can follow us on our Facebook page at The Sick Podcast. Follow us on an Instagram handle at The Sick Podcast. And follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel at The Sick Podcast. It's absolutely for free. More questions coming in. Sharing is caring. Marco Monaco. Good morning, guys. Happy New Year. This season is shot, and we all know it. Should Weber announce his retirement for next season, and who should wear the C? Stu? Well, it's surprising. Well, knowing Shea Weber, it's not surprising to me. But can you imagine the captain of any other NHL team in the situation Shea Weber is not speaking once yet to the media? And personally, I don't care if Shea Weber talks to us or not, but I think the fans, Canadians fans, would like to know, like, what's going on? Like, is there any chance you're coming back? Is there not? Even if he comes out and says, look, I'm not certain. I'm going to make a decision in the offseason. But, you know, he was in town to visit to see the team doctors. I thought then he might do, like, a 20-minute news conference with the media and let people know how, what's going on with him. But as, as I said, from knowing Shea Weber and being around him, I'm not surprised. But, again, I can't imagine – I could imagine the captain of the Leafs being silent like this or any other team in NHL for that matter. Stu, uh, if I can, the Canadians know the members of the media here um, will pound and pound and pound until the truth comes out, right? And they're worried about putting Shea Weber out there because he's basically going to say that he's unofficially retired. And that's the reason why he hasn't spoke yet. And it's the same reason why Carey Price hasn't spoke yet because they're worried that they're going to ask Carey Price – um, which substance was the problem, right? But so let's be honest player, here. Let, but let's be honest players. here, Stu, Stu. Yeah. The two most important players of the Montreal Canadiens are Carey Price and Shea Weber. The fact that it's January 2nd and they haven't said a word yet, I'm sorry, Stu. It's not acceptable. No. No, I, it's I, not. I, I understand. I understand Shea Weber 
He doesn't like dealing with the media. He doesn't like talking about himself. He's never hidden that fact that he doesn't. Carey Price doesn't like doing it either. Part of the question was, who do you think the next captain would be? Even when they shot, they got Shea Weber here. I wrote a column. I still thought Brendan Gallagher should have been the captain, because Gallagher dealing with the media is a huge part of being captain of the Canadians. Just like dealing with the media is a huge part of being coach of the Canadians or GM of the Canadians. This is a different market. Well, Toronto's the same, and the, the, a lot of the original six markets are the same. But Montreal even more so. Plus, you got the both languages. So even when they brought Weber in. I still thought Gallagher was the better candidate for the captain because he handles the media well. He, he, he doesn't mind doing it. He maybe even enjoys doing it. He's a spokesperson for the team. So I would have made Gallagher the captain, give Weber the eight. Gallagher, Gall, Weber would probably still be the real leader in the locker room. But for the public face of the team, I thought Gallagher was a better choice. And I still think Gallagher, if, if it was my I'm surprised they didn't name Gallagher captain at the start of the season. I've written about that already because I think a team needs a captain. And Mark Messier knows a lot more about me than whether a team needs a captain or not. Uh, I think it was the New York Daily News did a story because the Rangers yeah. don't have a captain this season. And Messier saying you have to have a captain. You can't not have a captain on a hockey team. It's an integral part of a team. You need to have the one guy who's the alpha dog, who's the. What leader. if you don't have a leader? What That's if you don't have a true leader? How much of that played into the problem at the start of the season? Yeah, but listen, is- I'm going to say this: Carey Price, Shea Weber. You don't like dealing with the media, this, that, or whatever. I say to them, guys. The contract that you have is part of the job, all right? There's 600000 to 800000 coming in gross or whatever it is every two weeks. You don't like it? Too bad. Deal with it. You got to answer questions. It is what it is. All yeah. right, more questions coming in. No, exactly. way we are answering it's questions. One second there, Tony. Exactly. Yeah. People will say to me, all you guys in the media are upset. He won't talk to you. I, I don't care if Shea Weber talks to me or not. I really don't. Me neither. But I think if I'm a season ticket holder spending thousands and thousands of dollars on tickets, and my renewal is coming up for next season. I, I maybe want to know what's happening with Shea Weber. Listen, Harry Price. I don't care either because I know what I need to know. I don't need people to ask them questions for them to sometimes give the correct answer or not. I know what's going on with both. Well, so I don't need to speak with them. But Jonathan Joy let it slip about Weber when he basically said Weber correct. was retired. But the fans deserve to know, and the fans deserve to hear from them. And by the way, and by the way, and I'm not going to go on this whole French-English thing, okay, because, um, you know, everyone knows where I stand. Um, But Carrie Price and Shea Weber should have made a better effort in French during their tenure with the Montreal Canadiens. I believe that. The the other thing, Tony, too, when you're two leaders like that, deal that way. I mean, Brendan Gallagher gave me a great quote a few years ago when I, asked, I thanked him at one point because he just was spending so much time with the media and dealing with it. He said, no, I realize I'm not talking to you, so I'm talking to the fans when I'm talking. You're through you. But when the two leaders of the team deal with dealing with the media and speaking to the fans that way, like Weber and Price do, the other guys are watching this, right? The younger guys are watching this and learning from this and they go, okay, well, if they can do it, I guess I can do it too. And I, I don't think that's a good message to be sending through the room, especially not in this market. Back to the questions we go. This one coming in from Michael Foresta. Thoughts on Mark Denis as a candidate? I think he's a bright man. Stu? Well, I know Mark Denis a little bit from being on the road, not a lot. He's a very bright guy. When you talk hockey with him, he's a smart guy. Uh, you know, he's been in an executive position. I think he's part owner of Shakutami, if I'm not mistaken. In the yeah. League. He knows the game. He knows the Canadians well. I mean, nobody's watched him as, you know, as closely as him over the last few years of his role in RDS. But he has no experience as a GM in the NHL. Um, no, he's got he, no experience he as an assistant GM, and, and Stu, he's got no experiences. And I like Mark Denis too. It's hard not to like Mark Denis. Oh, yeah. Everybody likes Mark Denis, but he's got no experience as a GM in the NHL. He's got no experience as an assistant GM in the NHL. He's got no experience as a pro scout in the NHL. He's got no assist experience as uh, an amateur scout in the National Hockey League. He's got no experience as a, a capologist in the National Hockey League. And albeit, uh, he does have experience with Les Saguenay de Chicoutimi you know, help running that team. And he's got experience, obviously, as a color man. But um, I, I think this interview process will be a good learning experience for him. But I don't think he's there yet. No, and I really like Mark Denny, too. As you said, it's hard yeah. to like Mark Denny. And if he was to get the job, I'd be happy for him getting it. Uh, so would again, I. I mean, the only reason he's really on that list is because they need to hire somebody who can speak French, right? And here's a guy who knows hockey. He's close to the Canadians. So that's why he's one of the guy, eight guys on that list. But, you know, the GM is going to learn under Jeff Gordon, whoever it is. Yeah. But 
Matthew Darsh is so far ahead of Mark Denny on that learning curve as far as being a GM. Yeah. And so much about being a GM in the NHL too, Tony, is contacts. You didn't know the other GMs. You don't have a personal relationship with them. So they're going to tell you stuff uh, sort of like you know, off the record type of stuff and let you know yeah. about guys. And, and that's a big, big part about being a GM. And that's one of the things that I think was a plus for Mark Bergevin is that he had a he knew the other GMs. Uh, he had a good relationship with them, I believe. Uh, you know, I've been told Mark Bergevin is a fun guy to be around in a personal situation. I've never yeah. been around him in that situation, so I don't know, but I've heard from a lot of people that he is. So being able to have that um, that you know, communication with the other GMs, I think, is very important. Still don't understand why Tony Marinaro is not on that list. He's got more contacts than Len Crafters. <laughs> All right, back to, the, uh, back to the questions we go sharing is caring. Christian Gendron. Hi, guys. Love the show. Merci beaucoup. With the kind of season and lots of COVID and injuries, the Habs remain close to the cap situation with all of them healthy. Do you see them bouncing back next season or another bottom of the pack season jam with some heavy contracts, Stu? Uh, first of all, I apologize. My, my spotlight here just went out, so I think I went a little bit dark on you. Don't worry about LED the next time, my yeah. friend. LED. But um, no, I think they're going for another year or two of uh, rough seasons with the Canadians. But you got to remember, this team should have missed the playoffs the last two seasons also. Yeah. The only reason they got in is because of the COVID and the scheduling and that. So, uh, yeah. No, they're not going to be, they're going to be a weaker team to start next season than they were at the start of this season. And I wrote a column at the start of this season saying, I can't see these guys making the playoffs just because there's been so much turnover, so many new guys, losing so many key players. And next season, they're not going to be as good as they were to start this season. So, there's a, a two, three year, you know, if you take the New York Rangers rebuild program, they were what, three years? Then they're starting to come around now. So that's the yeah. timeline you're looking at, at least. All right. More questions coming in. Let's get to them. Richard Pilon. Three things. Who else do we trade? Petrie, Sherratt, Toffoli, Drouin, Gallagher. Uh, Stu, listen, I think Sherratt's going to be traded. Okay. After that, I think uh, I think Petrie will be traded. I think Kerry Price eventually is going to be traded. Um, Brendan Gallagher, not so sure, but if I had to say yes or no, ultimately uh, in the end, I think he will be not so sure what you can get for pocket. Matthew parole will be traded. Not so sure in which order, but these are the players Stu, that will be traded. I believe over the next couple of years. And I think the Canadians are going to rebuild this year. And I think they're going to rebuild next year at the very least. The name I would add to that Tony is Jake yeah. Allen. I think, uh, I think not Jake so sure Allen about that. I think Jake Allen will be easier to trade. In fact, I'm certain he'll be easier to trade at the trade deadline than Carey Price will be if they decide they, they want to trade Carey Price. And if Carey Price agrees to be traded because he has a no movement clause. But no, at this point, you know, play, play Sam. To me, after the trade deadline, just play Caden Cremo the rest of the season, basically, with Montebo filling in every once in a while. And find, like, the thing that Gordon's able to find out now, he's seeing all these American Hockey League guys play. And he's going to see them for a long enough period to have a pretty good idea whether they can actually play at this level or not, which is one of the good things about the way this season is going. A bunch more questions coming in. Let's get to them. Uh, Nick says, Kirk Muller has moved on to Calgary. Calgary's power play is top three. Were the players not listening to Muller in Montreal? Listen, um, first of all, he has in Calgary a Johnny Goudreau, which I don't think he had in Montreal. He has a Matthew Kachuk in Calgary, which I don't think he had in Montreal, but he did have some good elements. In Montreal, I think it was, um, man, I don't know what it was, but I will tell you this. Muller's power play was never as bad as Burroughs' power play. Now, the Canadians have a lot of hurt players and a lot of players on COVID protocol, this, that, and all that stuff. That's I, I don't have the answer to this question. He's got a couple of elements in Calgary he didn't have here, but can it just be the overall pressure of playing in Montreal makes it more difficult to score? Stu? It could be, Tony. And you know, as Red Fisher used to say, you know, show me the players. And as you mentioned, there's some better power play players in Calgary. But power plays are weird, eh? I mean, Toronto struggled on the power play in the playoffs last season. How does that team not score on the power play with all that talent? I think a lot about power play is confidence. I think, you know, you have one game, two games, four games, six games without scoring. Guys start squeezing the stick, uh, start thinking too much. So a lot of it with power power plays are weird. Like you have teams with a lot of talent that have bad power plays, and you have some teams without so much talent that have good power plays. So I think it's a combination of things. I think Muller has, you know, is a Johnny Goudreau type player in Calgary, which he didn't have here. And they got off to a good start in Calgary on the power play. And I think that just carries on. All right, more questions. Let's go. Uh, Anthony says, do you think Gordon believes the prospect pool is actually good 
or a little overrated and not enough high-end talent? Stu, I'm going to make you tackle this one while I go get myself a mimosa in the fridge, courtesy of the Geloso Group. Okay, hold on a second. You yeah. tackle it, Stu. Um, I remember Guy Lafleur a few years ago saying the Canadians are a team of fourth liners. They put, like he said, they have four fourth lines or three fourth lines. And when you watch the guys the Canadians call up from the American Hockey League, whether it's a Pesetta or these other guys, they work hard, they try hard, they play hard, but the offensive skill just isn't there and they can't finish and they can't score on their scoring chances. The game yesterday with Pizzetta really impressed me, that little between-the-legs move he tried uh, on the breakaway. It almost worked. But again, I think the Canes are just – they have a lot of they have a lot of Jake Evans guys. They have a lot of guys that – they have too many guys that work hard. Arturi Lekin, they work hard. They do all the right things. They're great away from the puck, as the coaches always like to say. But they can't score. And they need to get guys who can score and who can finish chances. Yeah. They just have too many, too many good third or fourth line players and not enough – real top six players and especially at the center position the challenge that gordon is going to have to have is that he's going to have to trade away players who are not having their best seasons and when you trade away players when you're losing games they're not having their best season it's tough to be able to get full value for them and he's going to try and pull that one off all right more questions coming in mario perizino who's got a great website by the way gohabs.com you can take a look there on the archives and see all the previous trades of other previous general managers and all the acquisitions. With the big ask that Dominic Ducharme has been asked to do this season, do you think he'll be back next season? Yes or no, is Dominic Ducharme the coach of the Montreal Canadiens when the season starts next year? I say no, but with a but. Um, I don't think so. I think Jeff Gordon and the new GM are going to want their own guy. Uh, but is Jeff Molson going to agree to bring in another coach? The fact that, no, Claude this is Claude Julien's last year making 5 million bucks. So next season, uh, Ducharme's making 1.7 million. So I think, you know, I think most can eat that contract quite easily. Um, so I say no. Um, I think Don Ducharme right now is coaching for his future, uh, probably not in Montreal, but somewhere else proving that he can, um, can coach at this level. He's trying to stay in games, Ducharme. He's trying not to get humiliated. That's how he's coaching. I say Ducharme will be the coach of the Montreal Canadiens to start next season. Um, I say they're going to give him a chance knowing that this year just everything that had to go wrong went wrong. And it takes a while for a VP of Hockey Ops and a GM to put their stamp on the team. And usually they'll bring in their guy once they've done so. It'll probably take about a year, a year and a half for them to start putting their pieces in place. So I say Ducharme will be the head coach next season. If Matthew Darsh is the GM, the next Canadians coach, once again, will be Guy Boucher, in my opinion. Next question. Alex Sizzle, what is Brendan Gallagher's value on the market, and when do you think he'll be traded? Stu? That's a really good question. With Brendan Gallagher, it's all about health. I mean, you know, he's injured again now. Um, I have the utmost respect for Brendan Gallagher as a player, as a person. He gives everything he has every shift. His body's beaten up, though. Um, if it's a, if you have a hundred percent healthy Brendan Gallagher, the teams are knocking down the door, I think, to get him. Um, but now the way he's injured and with that big contract he has, I, I think it's it, it's going to be tough to move him. I think he's got to come back. Uh, the trade deadline's March twenty first. He's got to come back and and show he can play healthy and be healthy for an extended period of time and start producing more. But you know, a lot of the NHL is on reputation. And there's probably a team or two out there that like the way Gallagher plays, the leadership he has, the grit he has, and would want him for a playoff push and in the playoffs. So I think he can be traded, uh, but I think the Canadians will probably have to eat some of that contract. Stu, I have two trucks. One's a 2021. It works great. And the other one is a 2012. And it's been in the garage a couple of times, and it's breaking down. And I keep getting it fixed, but it's never the same as a new one. Brendan Gallagher, with all due respect to him, love him, love everything about him. But friends is friends, business is business. I trade him sooner rather than later. More questions. Because he just won't be able to run the same. Well, Tony, Jason contract, Party. Now, people are talking about how he's overpaid now and everything else. And you can agree with that. But he was underpaid for so many years when he was scoring three True. goals. But he's so still overpaid he, now. With Brendan Gallagher, he's earned every single dollar the Canadians have ever paid him. He has, but if you have to evaluate his contract right now and forget about everything in the past, mm -hmm. 
This is too much. Yeah. You think the Canadians should give Michael McNiven a few starts? He can't do worse than Montembeau. I would say he deserves the opportunity to start. 100% he does. I agree, but I wonder the, those statements he made when he came out and spoke against the team. The fact Mark Bergevin's not here now. You think he's being punished? Well, if Mark Bergevin was still here, I'm certain he would be punished, and there's no way he would be playing, which goes back to what I was saying about how Mark Bergevin would often take things too personal. But with Gordon here, it would make sense for him to play him too because he's an asset, right? You may as well see if he can what he can do. and See what he's got. Gonna, gonna keep playing Montembeau and Montembeau. And as I said, you know, after the trade deadline, if they do trade Jake Allen by then, uh, I think the net should be Caden Primos for the rest of the season to see what he can do since he's considered the goalie of the future. But McNiven, uh, I think he deserves to, to play at least a couple of games, give him a chance. All right, more questions. Let's go. I've been told we have a ton of them. MJV, does Price eventually come back or does Montreal continue to let him keep taking his time so that we lose more games? Put it this way, I don't know if he comes back. I say the Canadians will not rush him back. Stu? No, I wrote a column recently just saying that. Now at the Olympics are of the picture, I think Carey Price wanted to play in the Olympics and probably wanted to push himself to come back to play at least for two, three weeks before the Olympics to show the Team Canada bosses that he could be their Olympic goalie. Now that the Olympics are gone for the NHL players, to me it makes no point to have Carey Price come back this season unless he's really chopping at the bit and really, really wants to play. Let him get 100% mental healthy, mental health, physical health. If he's going to be staying here for next season, that's the way you want him to be. And if you're going to trade him, I don't think that's a, a trade you could make at the trade deadline. There's just too much money involved to, for a team to try and fit him in. I think that's a trade that's done in the off season. And I, to me, it, to me, it makes no point for Carey Price to, to push himself more than he's comfortable at all the rest of this season. Just let him take this season off and come back next year. Carey Price will be involved in a three-way trade at some point. It's brunching with Marinaro, East Duke Cowan of the Montreal Gazette. We're live on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and on Twitter. And on Twitter, click on the little bell, notify me. This way, you are notified. And you can do the same thing on Facebook, by the way. You can um, get notified every time we go live. So when we get go live, you get a notification, and then you can watch. Sharing is caring. Here's more questions. Andy Zaff, Happy New Year, gents. Happy New Year. How is... Marte Madden, not on the interview list, watching his resume on the ice. I personally believe he's the best pick for the next GM. I'm going to tackle it very quickly, uh, Stu. Martin Madden, 12 years as director of amateur scouting of the Anaheim Ducks, um, part of a club that uh, drafted um, so many amazing, amazing hockey players. Uh, I mean, who have they drafted? Under Martin Madden, they drafted Josh Manson. William Carlson, John Gibson, Sammy Vatanen, Hampus Lindholm, Ricard Raquel, uh, Cam Fowler, uh, Kyle Palmieri, Maxim Contois, Shea Theodore, Sam Steele, Troy Terry, Trevor Zegris. And in the last couple of years, as assistant GM under his watch, Jamie Drysdale and Mason McTavish. Um, I believe he's an amazing candidate. I believe the, he hasn't been interviewed yet because the GM is Gordon. And um, Martin Madden probably has the most experience of any candidate out there. It's true. And um, I just think that his strengths are Jeff Gordon's strengths, which is player evaluation and an eye for talent. Having said that, two heads are better than one. I would give Martin Madden an empty check, a void check, basically a blank check and say, fill in whatever amount you want. Um, and I'd add him to the organization. But that's that's my answer. Yeah, maybe they maybe they asked him and he's not interested, Tony. That could very well be that as well. And maybe, maybe that's he's why he's not being interviewed. He would have under Gordon. Maybe you hit the nail on the head. Or maybe, <clears throat> if you've ever been to Anaheim, and I've been fortunate to go a few times, I'd never want to leave. <laughs> It's Listen, beautiful there, but yeah, but I, I hear you. I mean, is it, it probably if he's not on the list, I have to think it's because he doesn't want to be on the list. Stu, you triple my salary and I'll go anywhere to work. I tell you that right now. Actually, maybe I wouldn't, but five times my salary, I would. Okay, more questions. Mike, what's the chance of Mark Hunter, a past first round pick of the Habs, as head of the scouting operations? I think that would be a fantastic candidate, Stu. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think he would be a fantastic candidate also, but 
back to the language thing, which always is a thing with the Canadians. One of the knocks on Trevor Timmons is that he didn't speak French. Or That's speak right. French. If you don't speak French, there's no way you could possibly evaluate talent. It's impossible. Well, I think the knock on him was that he did he wasn't closely enough connected with the Quebec Junior League because of that. But it's it's it is what it is, Tony. It's it's a reality of, of the Montreal market and with the Canadians with Jeff Molson as owner. I think he'd be a fantastic hire. So I have a solution, by the way. Hire the best candidate for the job to be the director of amateur scouting and have him improve the coverage in Quebec by 100%. There you go. All right, more questions coming in. Ralph Jr. Trotso. If Price gets traded, where is he going? Stu, he's going to go on a three-way trade and he's going to go to a team that needs a goalie. A team that is a goalie away from winning a Stanley Cup. That team could be Edmonton. That team could be, uh, out of all the teams that have a chance to win the cup, can it possibly be uh, maybe Colorado, who has a good goalie, but, you know, he's not Carey Price. Let's put it that way. You have any other names, Stu? Well, wouldn't it be interesting if we went to Colorado and Colorado won a Stanley Cup again with a former Montreal goalie? That would be something. Well, Carey Price is going to go wherever Carey Price wants to go. He has full control over this. And those teams make sense because, <clears throat> excuse me, at this point in his career, I think Carey Price was interested in winning another Olympic gold medal and winning a Stanley Cup, something he doesn't have on his resume. He does have an Olympic gold medal already. So it's one of those two teams you mentioned, I think, is Edmonton or Colorado. How do they fit him under the salary cap? There's a huge question. How much are the Canadians going to be willing to eat of that contract? The good thing about a rebuild is the salary cap is doesn't really come into effect because you're going to be well below the salary cap uh, as it is. And the other team that could be a possibility is Seattle. Not a team that's going to win the Stanley Cup, but Carey Price was willing to waive his no-trade clause for the expansion draft. It's near his wife's family and their home back there. And at this stage in Carey Price's life, he'd probably like to be less in the spotlight. And so I think it's one of the, it's either one of those teams that's competing for a Stanley Cup and needs a goalie that Carey Price would say, okay, I'm going to go there because I want to win a Stanley Cup. Or Seattle where he says, I'm going to go there. My life's going to be a lot easier. It'll be better for my family. Uh, and okay. I'll finish up my career there. All right. On to the next question. Let's go. Brunchy, one marinara with Stu Cow and Tony Delana. Will they get a first rounder for Ben Sherratt? Yes, they will. Next question. Yes. Yes, and maybe a little bit more, too. I well, agree with that. There's going to be a bidding war for Ben Sherrod. Luke Sherrod, don't we need to keep Sherrod? He will be the only veteran on the team we'll be able to count on. No, because um, history has shown us when, when defensemen, uh, or players, but when defensemen hit 31 years of age and they want a long-term contract because they're going to be UFA and it might be the final contract of their careers and it might take a five-year contract, you're going to end up regretting your three, four, and five of that contract. And Ben Sherratt's the player you want to keep if you're ready to win now. But if you want to rebuild, he's the last thing you need on your team. More questions. Yeah, and Ben Sherratt's not going to want to be here for a rebuild either. So uh, I, I, I would agree with anyway. that. Glenn Marchand, Happy New Year, guys. If the Habs get rid of Price, who do they uh, bring up from the minors or who would be a good fit for the rebuild? Well, if they trade Carey Price... Basically, they're going to go with Montembeau and Jake Allen, unless they trade Price and Allen. Stu, I'm not so sure they're going to trade Jake Allen. I do believe they're going to trade Carey Price. Uh, it wouldn't shock me if they trade Jake Allen, but they'll go with Montembeau and they'll go with Caden Primo. And they're not going to win too many games, and that'll be okay for the next couple of years. I think that's exactly the way they want it. More questions? With Here we go. Allen, though, Tony, one thing with Allen, yeah. a lot of it depends. If a number one goalie on an NHL team gets hurt, before the trade deadline, and they're desperate, that's good. Somebody will overpay for Jake Allen, and if somebody's going to overpay for Jake Allen, you make that trade in a heartbeat. Hey, you give me a number one pick in 2022, you give me a number one pick in 2023, uh, you give me the same thing for Ben Sherratt, uh, and maybe you won't get two number ones, but the more players you trade for number one picks, you go in to the 2022 draft, the 2023 draft with a lot of picks, that's when you can make a lot of noise, especially when you're going to be hosting the draft in July in Montreal. Kevin says, Happy New Year. Theoretically, what can the Canadians expect to get in return for Carey Price? I don't think that much, to be honest. I think for the Canadians, it's a case of more getting that contract off the books moving forward. Um, I honestly, I, 
maybe you can answer this one better than me, Tony. I honestly don't know what they would get for him on the market. And I honestly don't know if Jeff Gordon knows for sure what he would get on the market either. This is the way I see it going down. I see a three-way trade, and I see one team trading a prospect to the Canadians. I see one team trading a pick to the Canadians, and that's how I see the Canadians maximizing the value. That makes sense. And that's how I see a team going after Carey Price, because if the Canadians agree to pay 50%, the second team involved in the deal will agree to pay 25%. And then the team that acquire, acquires them really only has to pay 25% salary. You make but sense, I'll Tony. see big contracts moving around. You make sense with that, for sure. I'm not just another pretty face, too. <laughs> All right, okay, now more questions. Ricardo da Silva Ferreira. Do you think Gordon's first move would be a blockbuster Quebecer trade like Alexi Lafreniere? It can be good for both sides. I think that's what a lot of people are thinking, huh? Canadians get, listen, if the Canadians win the lottery and they get the first pick in the draft in Montreal, does he make a trade for Alexi Lafreniere? It's something that a lot of people would like to see. But I'll say this. You don't trade a centerman for a winger. And as much as Gordon wants to be loved by the fan base, he's not going to make an emotional move over a smart move. And I think the Canadians have brought in someone who's very intellectual and not very emotional, very businesslike. So I don't think he would, but for sure, if he would, they would appreciate it. More questions? Paul, I'll leave one this, uh, this one to you, Stu. How much money will Molson retain to trade some veterans like Petrie, Price, and Gallagher? It's interesting. I mean, like I said, with price, I think it would they'd have to eat half of it, I would think. That's still a $5.25 million cap hit for a goalie who's been injury prone since 34 years old for the team taking him. Um, Gallagher, probably close to half also. It's it's gonna they're gonna have to eat a lot of salary in, in any of these trades. But again, not necessarily Stu. Stu, not necessarily. You acquire a player who makes a lot of money in return with yeah. less term. And That's then you don't have to. So I'll say this. I'll say they're going to eat up half of Carey Price's salary, but I don't think they end up eating any salary on Petrie, and I don't think they end up eating any salary on Gallagher. Well, there could be a case of two where you take back somebody else's bad contract for these guys, and then you, in the offseason you try and move those guys too for more picks or more prospects or whatever. So, it's I mean, Jeff Gordon has his work cut out for him. He's got a, a busy, busy period leading up to the March 21st trade deadline and then during the offseason also. Sharing is caring. Share this video on Facebook with all your friends so more people can watch. More questions coming in. Johnny Jr. Potesta. What are the uh, players the Habs are looking for in trades when deciding to trade their veterans? Draft picks and prospects. Yep. Plain and simple. Doubt. That's young it. Young players with potential that I think they'll be looking at young players with potential. Alec Lafreniere is an interesting name you bring up. Obviously, there's a French connection there. But even if he wasn't French, here's a first overall pick. Who's got this is a second or third year in the NHL? He's got NHL experience. Uh, so I think he's 20 years old now. Those type of guys, those not necessarily, but those type of guys that are younger guys that already have some experience in the NHL and uh, the potential to, to really improve. All right, uh, more questions coming in, and, and you can send them on uh, Facebook. Uh, second year for Alexi Lafreniere 21 points in 56 games in year one, he's got nine points. In 32 games in year two. Remember last year, uh, he had left for the World Juniors, right? Lucas Clark, if you're Gordon, are you trading for Kratzoff before the deadline? Kratzoff is a former first-round pick of the New York Rangers. Uh, someone who has a lot of potential, but he's playing in the KHL. Hasn't yet reached that potential. I think it's players like that that will be interested in. More questions coming in. R uh, Roy Schrude. Why is Drouin not on your trade list? Is it his trade value at 5.5? He's another grossly overpaid relic of the Mark Bergevin regime. I don't think Jonathan Drouin will be traded this year. He's got this year and next year left on his contract. Yes, I think he'll be traded next year at the deadline when he'll only have a couple of months left on his contract and a team will add him thinking that he can help them make a push. So he'll be traded next year at the deadline. There's my prediction. Others yeah, coming in. Right, Tony. I don't know what the what the demand would be for Jonathan Drouin right now that he was in the NHL. Uh, let's go to the questions. Michael Sion, would you take back P.K. Subban? No, there's no reason to take him back. The Canadians are rebuilding, so why would you add P.K. Subban? There's, there's no reason uh, to take him back. The fans would love it, but uh, I don't see it happening. No. I don't think Jeff Molson would sign off on it either. 
Yeah, and uh, you know what? Um, I want to remember PK the way he played in Montreal the first time around. Look, he's still uh, a player that can contribute, but once again, PK Subban should go to a team that is a PK Subban away from winning the Stanley Cup. He shouldn't go to a Montreal Canadiens that want to be rebuilding for the next couple of years. And for PK, I hope he wins that cup. Luke Lemaire, Tony, we need to encourage our own people to lead the only team located in Quebec. Don't tell me that there's not enough talent in our province to find someone to do the job. Luke, Jeff Gordon was the assistant general manager of the Boston Bruins for seven years. Seven years. He was at the draft table one year. He drafted Kessel. He drafted Lucic. He drafted Marchand. He traded Raycroft in return for Tuka Rask. As unrestricted free agents, he signed Zdeno Chara and he signed Mark Savard. He then went to be the general manager of the New York Rangers for six years. Six. He made the deal for Strom. He made the deal for Zabinajad. He made the deal for Fox. He drafted Keandre Miller. Um, he drafted Schneider. Um, he signed Panarin, who from Quebec has that CV, who's available to be the GM. It's not Patrick Roy that's been the head coach and the GM of the Ramparts for 12 years and was the coach of the Avalanche for three years and has been out of the NHL for six years. And as much as I love Martin Madden Jr., who was a director of amateur scouting for 12 years and assistant GM for two years, that still does not equate to the experience that Jeff Gordon has at the managerial ex uh, position. Six years of assistant GM, experience in, in scouting, in signing contracts, seven years uh, as GM or seven years assistant GM. It, it, it just doesn't. I'm sorry. It's not Stefan Quintal that works for Department of Player Safety. With all due respect to him, it's not. So, look, I understand your point, but there's no one in Quebec that matches Jeff Gordon's CV. Unless you can give me somebody, there's nobody. You talk, we talked about the draft. We talked about the draft, Tony, and the Canadians, how the, the importance of just drafting the best player available, regardless of position. Yeah. That's what happened with Tuck and Yemi. They drafted because they need a center. Same with this hiring of Gordon. They hired the person, the best, most qualified person for their job, regardless of language. Having said that, we've talked about Matthew Darsh before. I think one of the reasons he's my pick, I think he has the potential, potential to be a very good GM in the NHL. Sure, he, has he does. The, he has all the qualities there to be a very, very good GM in the NHL. He's not right there yet, but what a perfect scenario for him to come in after learning from Julian Breezeboy the last two, three years, and then coming in and learning from Jeff Gordon now, three, four years down the line, you have a guy who I think could be rated right up there as a top GM. But it's, it's as you said, Tony, you don't just take a guy because he played for the Canadians or because, as you say, you know, we were talking about Mark Denis earlier or Stefan Quintal, and you just throw him into a general manager position. It's like taking a guy and throwing him in charge of Apple because he, you know, whatever was doing so, a video game or something. I'm all for hiring a Quebecer at equal talent. Yeah. But the Montreal Canadiens have insisted – on a French-speaking general manager and a French-speaking coach for the last 27 years. Zero cups, one final. And the year after the final, they're the worst team in hockey. All well, right, Tony, let's move on. One, one, one of the downfalls of Mark Burge, I mentioned before about how I thought you made things too personal. The other thing is, I don't think he listened to the advice he could have had. Sir Savard in his book wrote a whole chapter about how you know he, he had a key role in what Jeff Molson's decision to hire Mark Burge, right? And was sort of told at the time by Molson that Molson was interested in having Savard as an advisor position moving forward to help Mark Bergevin. But Mark Bergevin didn't want to listen to anything Sir Savard had to say. And I, like that, to me, it makes no sense whatsoever for a guy coming into a position where he had absolutely no experience. You don't have to agree with what Sir Savard tells you. But it's, to me, in my opinion, it's certainly worth listening to him. Same as if it's a Matthew Darsh coming in with Jeff Gordon. Matthew Darsh is smart enough that he's going to listen to what Jeff Gordon well, tells listen, him and learn from him. If I was Mark Bergevin, I had a chance to sit down and have coffee with Serge Savard. 
Um, I would I would pick Serge's brain on what he thinks uh, are the components needed to win a Stanley Cup. I would pick his brain. I would pick his brain and ask him when he thinks the general manager has to intervene on certain situations and go into the locker room. I would pick his brain on 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 leadership. Um, I would I would pick his brain on managing people, but I would not take advice on what to do in the modern day National Hockey League because you know. No, but dealing with people, Tony, is a huge part of being a GM. Yes, and Serge Savard was a master of that. I mean, talk to Chris Nyland about Serge Savard. Serge Savard traded Chris Nyland, broke his heart trading him from the Canadians. Chris Nyland still loves Serge Savard because he handled it properly, dealt with him as a person. It didn't become emotional. It didn't become personal. And I think that would have been the main thing that Serge Savard could have taught Mark Bergevin is how to separate business from getting personal. And if I was Mark Bergevin, I would have, when I got that job, I would have said, okay, Serge, I want to sit down for you for coffee every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock and just pick his brain. Or just talk about, you know, I have this issue. How do you think maybe I should deal with this personality or that personality? And that I would have been, never mind like the trade stuff and that, because you're right, Serge Savard's been away from the game for a while. But Serge Savard is a master when it comes to dealing with people. And a big part of a job as a GM is dealing with people. And one of the worst things that Mark Bergeron was at as a GM was dealing with people. Ask Andre Markov, ask Max Pacioretty, ask Alexander Radulov. All right, let's get back to the. Uh, I'm not going to agree with you on the whole Markov situation, by the way, uh, <clears throat> and I know we'll disagree on this one. That's okay. I think the Canadians treated Markov well. Okay, he was 38 years old. They had they had extended his contract on a couple of occasions after he had suffered ACL injuries. And yes, Markov was equally great for the Montreal Canadiens. He had a three year deal at 5.75 million. It expired. The last year of that deal, he was getting paid $4.25 million. The Canadians offered a one-year deal at $4 million with very attainable bonuses that would see him go to $5.5 or $6 million. He chose to represent himself. He fired his agent. He chose to represent himself, and he insisted on a two-year deal at $12 million, which if you took a look at the way he played in the KHL after that, he would not have lived up to that contract. Yes, it's unfortunate that he was 10 games shy of playing a 1,000 regular season games with the Canadians, but I don't think the Canadians disrespected him by offering him a one-year deal at $4 million with attainable bonuses going up to another $2 million. No, so but, you and I will agree to disagree on that one. But one thing, Tony, maybe maybe hypothetically, if, if Mark Bergeron sits down with Sir Savard in that situation, Sir Savard says, here's what you do. You go to Andre Mark, you tell him, Andre, get an agent. I, I want to deal with an agent. I don't want to deal with you because this – it's going to maybe become personal. I don't want it to be that way. I respect you. I like you. Hire an agent. I'm going to talk with him, and then we're going to get back and meet. And but maybe, tell your agent that, that I'm not – let your that agent know that I'm not offering more than a one-year deal. Deals. I hear you. I hear you. Other questions coming in. Brunchy, one man will try to get as many as possible. Glenn Delaney, what are your thoughts on the OHL reinstating Logan Mayu? My thoughts are uh, the OHL uh, made a decision, and uh, they're sticking by it. He was set to come back at the beginning of the new year. Stu? Yeah, I agree. Are you going to ban the kid for life from playing hockey? Uh, I don't... Well, they made a decision. All right, next. Lucas Clark, does Mayu come to the AHL as soon as next season, in your opinion? Stu? I wouldn't be surprised if Logan Mayu gets traded. Because I think Jeff Molson just wants to wipe the slate clean on that one and move on from it. From a PR standpoint. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he does, and I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't, because I can tell you right now, there are a lot of people in that organization that think he's going to end up being a heck of a hockey player. And I know that this isn't about hockey, by the way. Oh, yeah. I get it. But they made a decision. They said they were going to help rehabilitate this athlete, and trading him away, albeit feasible, can kind of look like they washed their hands and they wanted to give up on him. So... I wouldn't be surprised if it happens, and I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't, Stu. Okay, let's move on. Other questions coming in. Brian Smith, how many years of misery can we expect in Montreal? This year and next year at the very least. But yep. I think what they're going to try and do is like the Rangers, a couple of years, and then try and turn it around in a hurry. I don't think they want to go full rebuild four or five years. I think they want to do two to three. Stu? Yeah, I agree. And watching the game yesterday against the Panthers, as you mentioned earlier, it was fun watching guys work hard and compete hard, young guys. Yeah. 
So now moving forward, now you're going to meet, hopefully if this rebuild works well, have younger guys with more talent than what we're seeing on the ice now, working hard and playing hard. And as a fan, I think fans would be willing to live with that and watch these guys come up and grow together. And, you know, you go back to the old Edmonton Oilers days, the boys on the bus with Gretzky and coffee. I mean, you're not going to have those type, that, that, yeah. that sort of mentality where these young guys come up, they come up together, they grow together, they learn together, they lose together, they win together, and you build a team that way. So I think if what we're seeing now with these guys who, who no knock on these guys, I mean, they, they, you don't get to the AHL without being a really good hockey player or the NHL without being an outstanding hockey player. These kids, these guys that are playing now are giving everything they have, but they just they don't have the legitimate NHL talent. So if they have a young team with legitimate NHL potential and talent, I think it'll be fun to watch. Stu, we went for an hour. I'm going to try and go for half an hour now. I'm going to get on my Matrix T75 treadmill, matrixhomefitness.ca, try and burn a little calories. Most people watching us are going to go for lunch. It was brunching with Marinero with Stu Cowan, presented by Trey River. Tony, you have a fantastic show. I would encourage everybody to pass the message on to their friends. Says Luke Lemire. Merci beaucoup, Luke. Thank you very much. And Stu is one of our fantastic contributors who has joined us on more than one occasion with Brunching with Marinero on Sunday mornings. Tony, who cuts your hair? Truth be told, I do have a barber, but the last four or five times, it's me. So you see this hair? It's not perfect. I get it. I'm the one who cut it. How come what can I say? Ask, how come you didn't ask me that question? <laughs> I do my own also. <laughs> I cut my own hair. Last last night was number six on the top and number two on the sides. It's not perfect. Me, it's oh, number can one I say? everywhere. Number one everywhere on me, Tony. Good for you, Stu. Have a great Sunday, Stu. And thanks, everyone, for watching. You can follow us on Instagram at The Sick Podcast, on our Facebook channel at The Sick Podcast. We go Twitter live and follow us on Twitter at The Sick Podcast and our YouTube channel. Subscribe. It's absolute for free. And once again, on Facebook and Twitter, click on the notify me this time. This way, every time we go live, you will be notified. Have a great Sunday. The Canadians are off for over 10 days and they're going to recharge the batteries and hopefully come back healthier than they were before. Have a great Sunday and Happy New Year, everybody. See you, Happy Stu. Happy New Year, everybody. Cheers. Happy New Year.